pays font partie d'un territoire ancestral qui a longtemps servi de lieu de rencontre et d'échange entre les peuples autochtones, notamment la nation Ganyangeaga. Nous honorons, nous respectons et reconnaissons ces nations qui n'ont qui jamais cédé leurs droits ni leur autorité souveraine sur les terres et les eaux sur lesquelles nous nous réunissons aujourd'hui. Nous nous rencontrons aussi aujourd'hui en ligne et vous êtes peut-être sur d'autres territoires, y compris d'autres continents. Nous vous invitons alors à prendre un instant pour honorer et reconnaître les présences autochtones sur ces territoires, ainsi que les relations que ces peuples ont avec ces territoires à travers le monde. Merci d'être ici. Sarah et moi sommes très heureuses d'animer cette rencontre aujourd'hui et de partager ce moment avec vous. Euh, un petit mot sur la langue commune euh, euh, avec laquelle nous allons travailler, échanger aujourd'hui. Nous suggérons euh, de le faire en anglais parce que c'est la langue commune de, de nos invités euh, aujourd'hui. Et c'est donc afin de faciliter les échanges entre toutes et tous que nous avons euh, choisi de faire cet échange en anglais. Pour la période de questions, si vous souhaitez poser des questions en français, euh, n'hésitez pas à le faire. En fait, n'hésitez pas à les poser soit dans la conversation en français, puis euh, il nous fera plaisir de les traduire. Et euh, également, vous pouvez lever votre main, le, poser la question en français, puis on pourra la traduire euh, également. Donc, euh, surtout, on ne souhaite pas que ce soit une barrière euh, aux échanges. Um, donc, je m'appelle Doris Farger, I am a law professor uh, at the Department uh, des sciences juridiques à l'UCAM, Université du Québec à Montréal. I am also a regular member uh, of uh, GRIAC Sierra uh, Montréal. And I will let, let Sarah uh, also, uh, for she, she present herself. Thank you so much, Doreen. So, uh, Doris, sir. my name is Sarah, Sarah Petrella. I'm a postdoc researcher at the University of Fribourg in Switzerland, and actually uh, and uh, presently leading a Swiss National Science Foundation project. And, and this project aims to reconnect old items in museum collection, for example, from the 17th century, with a curator, artist, and indigenous expert living today in North America, especially in Quebec. And I am also a member of Sierra and also a collaborator for a very special event I'm presenting after, uh, an exhibition with an NGO in Geneva called DOSIP, Indigenous People's Center for Documentation, Research and Information. Thank you, Sarah. So we will talk a little bit, Sarah, Sarah and I, just to introduce, and then we will let our presenters to speak, and we are looking forward um, uh, to, to, to introduce the moment. Uh, we would like to say that, as you may know, uh, Sierra has already worked on the United Nations Declaration on Indigenous Peoples, um, which is also called UNDRIP under its English acronym. For example, uh, Les Cahiers du Sierra, as uh, a research center magazine, published a new issue on this theme last spring. This issue brings together the writings of several colleagues around the theme of the declaration. And I will share uh, the link in one moment. I also say hello to Geneviève Motard, who is with uh, us uh, today and who uh, directed this uh, number. Um, It, we, we, we worked on UNDRIP at the Sierra uh, because UNDRIP is identified as an avenue for its, poten its potential in the process of legal decolonization, which was valued by several commissions of inquiry in Canada, especially the Canadian Truth and Reconciliation Commission and the Commission d'enquête sur les relations entre les autochtones et certains services publics, écoute, réconciliation et progrès also known in Quebec as the Commission Viens. And DRIP is also used by certain indigenous groups, communities, and people, such as in the Joyce Principle, which is based on Article 24 of the Declaration. Um, I, I share you um, the link um, with uh, Sierra, Cahier du Sierra uh, number, and you can see uh, the work done. One moment, one little moment, just to find the discussion. Sorry. Here you are. 
So what is NDRIP? NDRIP is a resolution adopted by the United Nations uh, General Assembly on 13th of September 2007. The mere fact of signing such a resolution does not have the effect of legally binding the signatory states. However, and even though it is not an international treaty, it has given rise to legal and constitutional reform, reforms in various states. For example, Bolivia has incorporated UNDRIP into its constitution. In Canada, on the 20th, 21st of June 2021, the federal government adopted legislation to implement the UN Declaration, which requires uh, Canadian federal laws to be compatible with UNDRIP. And I let Sarah to add some words to this. Yeah, because the idea today and with Doris is to talk about it, to think about arts and law. And the declaration is in a certain way between the two of them. Why? Uh, because arts and UNDREP are linked on two levels. Uh, the first one is that there are material heritage, I mean, historical picture of indigenous delegates at the UN at Geneva, for example. And that picture, that material is um, material heritage. Uh, most of them are kept at uh, DOSIP, I mentioned before, for example, and are protected as memory of the world program at the UN UNESCO. And uh, this is on the one hand, so cultural heritage. And on the other, uh, of course, UNRIP is used today by indigenous artists, such as Barry Ace, uh, and allows then artistic practice to circulate the law and make it known and also appropriate it. And we would add also that UNDRIP has been uh, negotiated during 25 years, and it's a negotiation uh, on which uh, many indigenous groups around the world took part, and more than uh, 140 countries signed uh, the documents. So just because I'm... I'm participating to this roundtable from Switzerland. Just a quick word about Switzerland and Switzerland Museum. Um, so uh, in Swiss Museum, valuing indigenous voices and collaborative approaches in general is in full development, as we will see today. And some projects, some museum projects have gone further bringing the UNRIP into the museum, museal context. Uh, I'm thinking of the Geneva Museum of Ethnography exhibition in 2021, Environmental Injustice, or the more recent exhibition celebrating Descai Levi General Centenary, one of the first indigenous leaders at the UN 100 years ago. Uh, and it was a project with an indigenous curator you could know, Jolyn Ricard, myself with the DOSIP and the city of Geneva. So this uh, roundtable is part of this desire to share inspiring and innovating artistic practice between indigenous people's self-determination and artistic creation and innovation. It's also for us an opportunity for dialogue between several disciplines uh, such as art and law, but not only because if UNRIP is an ideal that we want to put into practice, we were looking to bring together multiple expertise from all over the world, uh, indigenous and non-indigenous researchers, jurists, artists, and so on. So uh, today uh, we will talk about the Barry Ace workshop, performance, installation uh, uh, that dialogues with the UNRIP, so it's perfectly in line with our desire to build a bridge between Canada and Switzerland, uh, since it was created in partnership with two Swiss museums, the MEG, and in Geneva, and the NONAM in Zurich. So today, we are very, very lucky to be able to talk to some of the people who have been involved into the whole process of creating this, this installation, Barry Ace, who is a multidisciplinary artist, and then uh, Lucy Mono, 
conservateur at the Geneva Museum of Ethnography, the Met, and Hyde Hoon Love, head curator and director of North American Native Museum, NONAM, or in German, North American Native Museum. So we would like to thank them again for accepting our invitation. We'll give them the floor, starting with Barry Ace, who will talk about his installation over the next 30 minutes. And then Lucy and Heidholm will take the floor, followed by a question and answer session. So as Doris told you, for this question period, you will be invited to either raise your hand to take the floor or ask questions directly in English if you want, but also ask your question in French if you prefer to, and we will be happy to translate it, of course. Uh, you can also ask your question in the chat room. And without further delay, the floor goes to Barry A. Thank you so much. We can hear you, Barry, sorry. I said, thank you, Sarah. Um, I'm just gonna start by uh, setting up my PowerPoint so I can share it with you. And um, let's see here, okay, let's, uh, whoops. Okay, let's get in here. Presenter view. And you should just have the, the introductory slide, okay. All right, um, I'm gonna set my timer because it's 30, <laughs> it's 30 minutes and I'm pretty close to that, I'm sure. Um, first of all, uh, again, I'm really honored to be here. Uh, this project uh, was, it's, uh, it, uh, it, it's, it took a long time. It was quite a process because it actually uh, spans um, almost uh, four years. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, about the uh, the projects and the because the UNDRIP project that I did in uh, Switzerland is uh, linked to an earlier work that I did in Windsor. Um, but again, you know, I'm just going to be talking really about the transformative power of art engagement and social justice. Um, my biography, you know, you can go online and check it out. But I'm a citizen of Chagin First Nation on Manitoulin Island. I currently live in Ottawa. Um, my work uh, is really about uh, challenging this notion of stasis. Um, you know, my work looks at the historical and it uh, it uh, communicates and uh, and relates to uh, the contemporary. So it's a confluence between the historical and contemporary. Um, and I work primarily with uh, uh, electronic components, which are the refuse uh, or e-waste or the detritus of uh, contemporary society. And I incorporate uh, floral motifs based on Great Lakes uh, floral beadwork. And that is kind of the, uh, the work that I am known for. I also do performance as well. And um, the uh, work that I did in uh, these two projects that I'm gonna be talking about incorporate the electronic components. And there's a beautiful simile between the glass bead and electronic components because in Anishinaabe Moin, a glass bead is called the menedominence. So it's a spirit or an energy berry um, and the in the electronic component, especially the capacitors, those are those bright colored ones, they actually hold and release energy. So there's, like I said, a nice simile between the two. Some of the terms I want you to consider while I'm talking about the projects are uh, social justice art. Um, art uh, for social justice, it encompasses a wide range of visual and performing arts. And its aim is to raise critical consciousness, build community, and motivate individuals to promote social change. So that's kind of the premises for the premise for which these two projects that I'm going to talk about were built upon. And also collaboration uh, is the process between two or more people. Uh, a collaboration is a purposeful relationship in which all parties strategically choose to cooperate in order to accomplish a shared outcome. In both of these projects, that was uh, the premise for it. I'm not gonna go into contract or treaty because you're all law students. And if you don't know that, then maybe you shouldn't be in law right now. <laughs> so, um, I'm gonna start off too, just with a, a, a short video uh, that uh, the Meg uh, undertook when I did my residency on Wawindamawa, which is based on the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People, just to kind of give you a, um, a, a feel for how the workshops uh, looked visually while they were undertaken. Thank you. 
So the well with the bomb. The Wawa well Damawa project that uh, is a part of the um, the North American Native Museum exhibition that uh, uh, addressed treaties in Canada. Uh, the work actually started for me um, back in 2018, in November of 2018. I was invited to the University of Windsor uh, and uh, to participate and develop a project uh, that would be uh, in. Uh, it would coincide with the uh, 2018 World Indigenous Law Conference. So uh, the, the they established a law, an, an artist in residence program. It was called Art and Law Indigenous Artists in Residence Program, and it was a partnership between the Council of Windsor Region, University of uh, Windsor Faculty of Law, and the School of Creative Arts. So it brought together, you know, legal linear thinkers and artists who are holistic thinkers and brought them together to uh, engage in some kind of collaborative project. And that was the premises from which I was uh, asked to participate. And it was, and the the completion of the project uh, coincided with the, uh, with the conference uh, where the river bends the application of indigenous laws in indigenous communities and in the courts. So it brought together people from all over the world. There were people uh, from Australia, people from uh, New Zealand, people from the United States, and uh, so they all. Uh, the the uh, exhibition was uh, free, was uh, was coinciding right with this uh, with this conference, and so everybody got to see it. So it was uh, it was very important, and uh, the idea that I had was that I wanted to do something around the truth and reconciliation uh, calls to action. Uh, the 94 calls to action that stemmed out of the uh, the uh, research into uh, and, and and public meetings that dealt with the experience of residential school. So I looked at the truth and reconciliation calls to action and thought about how could I incorporate that into a um, into a project, into a visual, because, you know, I'm taking something that's very legal, very complex, and I have to turn it into a visual, into a visual language. Um, so, you know, the resident, the, the, the Truth and Reconciliation uh, Commission and the calls to action stemmed out of the uh, Indian Residential Schools settlement. And uh, between 2007 and 2015, the government uh, they invested quite a bit of money. There was like six, 6,500 witnesses who testified at these uh, these public hearings, and uh, brought uh, all this all this experience and and um, and need for change to the commission. And in June of 2015, the TRC launched its 94 calls to action. And interestingly, within the uh, 94 calls to action, if you do a search on it, there's 21 times that UNDRIP is uh, the United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People is referenced within those calls to action. So the two are very intrinsically um, linked. Um, CBC has put together a uh, uh, calls to action. It's uh, it's called Beyond Ninety Four, and it tracks the uh, since the release of the uh, of the Ninety Four calls to action in twenty fifteen. It tracks the actual. Um, work that has been done to date. Um, and you can see it's it's not anywhere near uh, what it should be. Um, only 18 uh, to date have been uh, completed. All the rest are in either proposed or in various stages of development. And each of those little red dots, you can actually click on one. And I think I clicked on it when I did the screen cap there and it deals with uh, corporations and uh, the relationship uh, and their role and responsibility in uh, implementing UNDRIP. Um, two important calls in there that I wanted to address as well was uh, 83, which called upon the Canada Council to establish as a funding priority a strategy for Indigenous and non-Indigenous artists to undertake collaborative projects. Well, they funded part of my project, so the Canada, so it met that condition of, uh, of 83. And then uh, 28 uh, law schools in Canada were required to um, take uh, a course on Aboriginal people in the law, which the University of Windsor has done. So the uh, project then uh, takes on a little bit more meaning because all of those participants who participated in the project met Call 83, and many of the students as well had taken courses. So, you know, they've they've already met two of the 94 calls, and, and they were really, really proud to be able to say that they had uh, participated in this project and uh, were meeting some of the calls to action. Um, 
so I wanted to uh, the project to be uh, based on uh, an indigenous uh, uh, what we would call contract law or, or treaty, uh, which are wampum belts. So both the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabek had and still use uh, wampums. Wampum is a, made out of a quail shell and it's linked together as a readable belt. Um, this is an example of a wampum belt. Um, and this is the uh, dish with one spoon, which is a uh, wampum belt that talks about shared resources uh, between the Haudenosaunee and Anishinaabeg peoples in the Great Lakes region. Um, and it basically talks about, you know, when you take what you need, you share, you leave something for others and you keep the dish clean. This is the idea of, of the contract of that relationship. So I wanted to build a, a piece that would uh, have that kind of a relationship between nations, between myself uh, in, as term, in terms of being Anishinaabeg and then the students as well as coming together as law students so that we could create some kind of, um, you know, social, social justice kind of a document, I guess you could say. Uh, so that is coming from the Indigenous perspective. But, you know, I wanted to also have the students understand what, um, uh, you know, have something to relate to. So I decided to do a contract for them. So in order to participate in the workshops to create this new project, they had to sign away their rights. So I created a little legal document myself that they all had to sign and I gave them a, uh, a dollar. And so they had to uh, sign this document and they surrendered all of their interest in that work. So if I sold it for a million dollars, they would get nothing out of it because they were paid for participating. I wanted them to experience this relationship of giving something up. Uh, I'm not really necessarily understanding what you're giving up. I only had one student who said that she wouldn't sign it. And I said, well, you can't participate. Uh, so um, everybody else signed it. And then the other thing I wanted to do was I wanted to have dialogue. So I wanted to create a workshop where everyone would sit around and talk about the uh, 94 calls to action. And uh, so what I did was uh, when you came into the room, um, you had to pull from a hat one of the calls to action. And then you had to sit down and you had to write it in cursive writing on vellum. Um, the act of writing something out is very meaningful and you have to pay attention to what you're doing. So just I, I thought it would be uh, an interesting process for the students to do. And also I thought that it would be great that they would be able, that I could actually use that vellum transfer uh, into and embed that into the work. So what we did over five days, we had 94 students participate in the project, uh, all um, signed the contract, all of them wrote out the call to action. We sat in a circle uh, and discussed what each of these uh, calls to action were and, and fielded questions. Now, this wasn't just open to students. It was also open to the general public. And we did have some Indigenous uh, individuals who, who participated. And they brought an incredible amount of knowledge and experience to the project that the students wouldn't have not, not would not have normally had. And one individual was actually in uh, had had gone through residential school. So he was very generous in coming every day and participating and sharing his stories with the students. Um, so we worked and uh, completed them. What I wanted them to do as well was to create a panel with my digital beadwork on it for representing floral motifs. So Basically, we uh, each we did 54 panels with these uh, floral motifs uh, and tobacco ties were attached because everybody received tobacco ties. And then I rolled up all of those calls to action. There's 94 of them on 54 panels, and then they are beaded and stitched to the piece itself. And so the piece itself, actually, uh, when you go up close to it, you can actually see the cursive writing through the uh, calls to action, like of the calls to action through the vellum. This is what it looked like when it was put on onto the uh, gallery wall. Um, this is Troy. He uh, was a residential school survivor. He was there every day and participated in it. And he it was very, very meaningful for him to have participated in it. Um, so you can see it resembles a belt, a wampum belt. There, the end of it has electronic wire coming out, which is the communication wire that I use in terms of contemporary communication. And then the, the 54 panels with the uh, calls to action attached to them. Also, as part of the agreement was that um, I wanted all names of individuals uh, uh, to travel with the piece, uh, all the participants that traveled with that, wherever the piece goes, their names are always put on the wall. 
And the numbers uh, are not, we're not assigning numbers to anybody to make somebody feel that they're being, you know, uh, like uh, given a number as you would have been in maybe perhaps in residential school. These relate to the call to action for which that person was responsible for. So each of the numbers on the 94 there is what the, what the individual wrote in terms of their, um, of their participation in the project. I also included other work in the exhibition to kind of give it additional context. I included this one piece that I had done in earlier that year at uh, Ontario College of Art and Design, where I was uh, re a visiting resident. And I produced this work. It's called How Can You Expect Me to Reconcile When I Know the Truth? And this deals with my own perception and my own experience of having family members that have gone through residential school. So on the back wall, there's a title that says Debuin, it means truth. And I created a cradle board uh, in there where the uh, where I have overlaid on it uh, family photographs of members that had attended residential school. I had the schematic drawings of the uh, of the uh, residential school lands in Spanish Ontario, which is a residential school where um, our family went and others from Manitoulin Island went. And then I wanted to put it on a pulley system and have used this rope. The rope relates to um, how the children were pulled from Manitoulin Island behind a boat with a with a, a, a rope. So I wanted to incorporate some of those smells and some of those the material materiality of which those children would have experienced. And also when I when I installed the work, it ended up looking like a, a um, scale of justice or a scale of injustice. Um, the Tikkanogon is totally covered uh, in this case, but inside of it there is a um, a vintage uh, small brown uh, cloth doll. Uh, that uh, I included in there, and, and it was buried. Uh, it's, it's covered over in terms of not being able to to see the piece when it's exhibited. Um, I, I crafted small uh, children's moccasins out of uh, a, a bronze screen, and I incorporated those with the floral motif on them, uh, and they're held empty because that's what the residential school did. It stripped a lot of culture out of people. The trail dusters on the back are based on a historical tra uh, moccasin where you would walk and the, the fringe would erase your tracks. But in this case, these are all suspended vertically and they're hanging down uh, on the rope and they cascade into a, uh, a bundle of, uh, of rope on the bottom because it really talks about, I don't want those stories to be erased, but it also talks about the entanglement of this history. It's a very entangled complex complicated history. And some of these shoes do not have any beadwork on it. And those are the ones that uh, represent the children that did not make or survive residential school. Um, the, as I mentioned, they were children. This is a, a, a Spanish school. Uh, children were brought over by boat uh, and, and, and incarcerated really into these uh, boys and girls school. Um, and those are the two schools uh, that the children were interned in. And later on, after I completed the piece, I found um, a uh, auditor's report from the 1920s on these two schools. And this is just around the time when they started to find the children in unmarked graves across Canada that were missing and, and, and had been buried there. And this is an auditor's report from Spanish. And if you look at the bottom paragraph, the uh, auditor, I'm just going to paraphrase because I can't see it very well, but it, he, he talks about how he noticed that there were uh, an unusual number of graves that uh, were there in the cemetery, and there were many more hidden in the grass. And he said, this is really unusual because the school has not been in existence that long. And then there's a, a graphite line, and then you'll see the term graves written beside it. When I read that, I immediately exposed the baby in the Tikkanogon, in the how can you expect me to reconcile when I know the truth, because now those children were now being found. So, you know, this is how art and policy and law all kind of come together in a piece itself and how meaningful it can be when individuals experience, experience it. Um, let's see here. So then I was invited to be uh, in, in 2022 in an exhibition uh, that was uh, curated by the um, North American Native Museum in Zurich, and it was called Wa Windamawa. And that's what that it was that translates to promise in Anishinaabe Moe, and that's what we call treaties, Wa Windamawa, to make a promise to somebody. Uh, so 
for this piece, I knew that I wanted to do something around the United Nations Declaration of the Rights of Indigenous People because this is Switzerland and, and I knew Geneva was there and I knew that's the home of the United Nations and the Declaration is a uh, very important uh, uh, a part of the uh, of the United Nations. So I said, well, I want to do a new piece around that. So that's where I decided to do the Wawindamawa. And as you know, I'm not going to go through the, the UNDRIP, but uh, you already talked about how uh, it was uh, it was brought in in 2007. And ironically, uh, four votes were against it in 2007. Canada was one of them. Canada did not um, uh, agree to it. And it wasn't until June 21st, 2021, that Canada uh, they actually received royal assent and came into force. Um, and the article, is, uh, as I mentioned, is very important. It, 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 it identifies um, our rights and our cultural objects, et cetera. As I said, there's 21 reference to it uh, in the, or 21 in uh, the Truth and Reconciliation. And this one was really important. The only province, you know, the, pro the only province in Canada that has actually, uh, at this point, I think, done anything. Uh, this happened when I was doing the workshops. And uh, uh, it just came out uh, in March, and I was doing the workshops in April of 2022 in, in Zurich. So BC revealed an 89-point action plan to advance the rights of Indigenous people. So that uh, that came into effect. But not all provinces have been uh, receptive or have moved forward with it. Um, and Ontario was one of them. And uh, I'm involved, uh, uh, my community, uh, Shagin First Nation, is one of the 21 First Nations who uh, challenged the um, Robinson-Huron Treaty of 1850. So we went and took no issue with the, uh, with the uh, annuities that we were paid. Uh, the annuities were only increased once, um, and they went from like $1.70 to $4 a year. So we challenged the the province of Ontario, and uh, it was favorable, and it was advanced right up to the Supreme Court of Canada. But recently, the federal government and the province of Ontario have agreed that they will uh, settle with us. And so uh, there is now uh, uh, an agreement that's being under negotiated, and the headlines were, Canada has a lot of unpaid bills, 10 billion settlement reached in landmark First Nations treaty case. Canada is very complicated by treaties, and you know the the UNDRIP talks about treaties and talks about uh, you know honoring their relationship between Indigenous peoples and sovereignty and the Crown and treaties. You know, there's historic treaties. There's 70 recognized treaties that are just basically historic treaties that would be from the numbered treaties, the Robinson Huron, and even early you know peace and uh, friendship treaties in Canada. And then there's modern day treaties that are also out there. The James Bay Agreement of 1975 is an example. And I believe even none of it you could almost probably put into that notion of a modern day treaty. Um, and then within the, the federal government's uh, treaty uh, uh, policy, they have uh, what's called specific claims. So these are, uh, are uh, claims that are relate to, to unfulfilled uh, conditions within those treaties. So First Nations can take the federal government to court to claim specific issues around them and, and receive compensation for that as well. So as you can see, even though UNDRIP mentions, you know, it's recognition of treaties, et cetera, it, it is in some countries very, very difficult and very convoluted because there are so many different treaties that, uh, that we're dealing with here. So the whole idea of this particular piece was to create Wawadabawa, and so I wanted to create vessels. So these are floor vessels that I created, and I wanted the students to do very much like we did in the Truth and Reconciliation uh, piece. Uh, there's 46 articles in the um, in the uh, declaration, and I wanted 23 students to in, in Zurich and Geneva to write out those uh, articles, discuss them like we did with the uh, Truth and Reconciliation, and then they would be put into these vessels, and they would be exhibited directly below the Truth and Reconciliation belt. So the two pieces are in dialogue because they are intr intrinsically connected. So again, I had them sign a form, paid them uh, one Swiss franc, and then I had these small little medallions that I made out, which has the uh, UNDRIP uh, articles in the background and a beaded piece. And the students received a small package when they came in, they wrote it out, they beaded it. And I didn't care if they finished beading it or not, because that was important too. Some students were very diligent. They wanted to finish the beadwork. Some didn't. But get, and the unfinished part of it is important to the artwork because that shows that this, the work is still ongoing. It's not complete. 
Uh, so they had the undrip uh, the brochure. They had uh, the tables all set up when they came in. And then we sat there and you can see each each student read their article and then we discussed it. And we were very lucky to have uh, Helena, Helena uh, uh, Nyberg there because Helena, that's uh, Helena here, uh, she was uh, involved in the uh, uh, in the development of the UNDRIP at the United Nations. So she brought a lot of really important history to the workshop. So uh, this was uh, this was important, and this is the workshop that was held at NONAM. And while we were there too, um, uh, ironically, the uh, just the um, chief of the Assembly of First Nations went to the United Nations because this is when all the children were being found and asked for Canada to investigate the role in residential schools. So that brought more to the to the uh, process that we did. Then we went to the Meg in Geneva and there the uh, workshop was uh, again advertised and students showed up for the workshop. It was held in uh, in this rotunda area and which really felt like we were at the United Nations because it's, uh, the, the room was quite, quite uh, impressive. Um, but the students came, like this was a mixture of law students and there was uh, uh, museum staff uh, that participated. But I love like this one student showed up and she had this t-shirt and said, museums are not neutral. And I thought that that's that was really powerful. You know, here the students, these law students are coming. They know they're coming into a space that isn't neutral, that has issues around Indigenous uh, reparation, that kind of stuff. So we discussed the uh, the uh, calls to action. I did a presentation on it. And then after we finished and we brought the work back and we installed all of the medallions that everyone had done in the vessels, we got a call um, from the uh, Canadian Embassy they caught wind that we were in uh, Zurich and there was an exhibition uh, around truth and reconciliation and the um, the uh, UNDRIP. So they sent out their some of their advisors to check it out. So I gave a tour to one of their um, one of their uh, advisors and then he went back and then the ambassador got involved. So that was the work when it was installed with the Truth and Reconciliation Bell. Nonam did a fantastic installation of it and the vessels on the floor. There was a video that uh, uh, a cinematographer, uh, Dylan McLaughlin, did on my practice in my studio in uh, Ottawa here. And that's kind of how the uh, pieces were. And they were in sitting in sand that had cedar, sage, sweetgrass in, in there, which are the sacred medicines of, uh, of Anishinaabek. So I wanted to make sure that they, those pieces were honored in that way. Uh, so there I am explaining the piece to the uh, ambassador. And I did a number of public presentations on the work. The ambassador opened uh, the uh, treaty day uh, event, which uh, was on April 30th, uh, coincided with the exhibition. There was a robust uh, presentation of panels and discussion. This exhibition was also with two other artists, Anishinaabeg artists, friends of mine as well, Frank uh, Shabagagat and Michael Belmore, who also contributed to this, uh, this uh, treaty exhibition. Um, so there's the install here. Like months later, I was still getting emails from the students, you know, your workshop at Nonam and Zurich was one of my personal highlights, you know, at Christmas, you know, I sent out this letter. Thanks again for sharing your knowledge, your experience, your stories in my Christmas letter, which I send to family and friends all over the world. I wrote about UNDRIP and the workshop to let them know how important this event was for me. So I still get emails from students that are interested now in looking at Indigenous rights. And as you know, the work was used on the cover for uh, Sierra. And uh, then uh, I was involved that coincide with the workshops. I was in an exhibition called Environmental Injustice at uh, the Meg. And um, one of my pieces was, it was borrowed from Nonam. So years ago, I had been in Nonam and I had seen a Medewa wind piece, an otter, uh, ceremonial bag and it was so powerful to me that I had to respond to it I took it I went home asked for an image of it and then I wanted to recreate it but I wanted to make a contemporary art piece not a ceremonial piece but this piece inspired me to do that it was almost like it was it was pushing me to do it so I did it so I made a contemporary piece with my electronic components and uh, um, both of these pieces ended up being borrowed by uh, 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 the Meg for the Environmental Injustice Exhibition. 
Um, a delegation of Menominee went through and spotted the bag and wanted it removed and wanted it repatriated. So that opened up a whole other line of discussions. Both institutions, NONAM and the MEG, have been really, really open to this whole notion of engagement with Indigenous people and, and issues around uh, reparation of, of sacred cultural objects. Um, in the MEG, I went through and I spotted this bag. It was labeled as Haudenosaunee. I'm still researching, but I'm almost positive that it is Anishinaabeg. It's got a morning star configuration on it, which the Haudenosaunee did not use. The belt itself is too small for a bag because if you put that on your shoulder, it would be right tight under your arm. I think it's actually a, uh, a wampum belt and it has um, and it has diamonds on it. Uh, so it is actually to be, it actually has some kind of significance. It's actually a wampum uh, that would have been stored perhaps inside. Um, and Article 12 of Undrip there, Article 12.2, states shall seek to enable the access and or reparation of ceremony objects and human remains in their possession through fair, transparent, and effective mechanisms. Both of these institutions, the NONAM and the MEG, are doing that. Canada has come up with its own museums policy as well through the Canadian Museums Association, decolonize your re, um, uh, repatriation policy, and uh, it's uh, that's out there. So I just wanted to bring this in because uh, hopefully it'll be a helpful segue for uh, for Runa and for uh, Lucy to uh, pick up on. Um, so that's my website. That's my presentation. And looking forward to questions around it. Thank you. Thank you so much, Barry. It was so interesting. Uh, Lucy, if you'd like, it would be your time to take the floor. Hello, everyone. Thank you very much for inviting me to this roundtable, and thank you, Barry, for your um, brilliant uh, presentation. Uh, do you see my screen? Is it? Oh, it's still not. It's still just PowerPoint. So I have to. Actually, I'm going to skip very quickly to another slide, so I leave this one. Um, so yeah, thank you very much for having me in this roundtable. It's a pleasure to share with you. Uh, how we participate in, in Barry's uh, um, collaborative work that she, he offered us to, to take part in. And also, um, I think it's, it's uh, important for me to uh, introduce the context in which we, we took this, uh, we, we did this collaboration because we, uh, the workshop took place within the exhibition Environmental Injustice, Indigenous People's Alternative. Uh, in a in a kind of a teaching space that we have at the end we had at the end of the exhibition, so um, um, this exhibition that opened in September twenty twenty one was led by um, Karine Ayele Durand, who uh, is our former chief curator and who is now the museum's director. And um, for this aim of the exhibition was to highlight the experience of indigenous peoples and their perspective, knowledge, and know-how in dealing with the damage to their land accelerated by climate change. And in this exhibition, an important focus was given to the United Nations Declaration, the UNDRIP that we already mentioned, um, a text that, as you know, uh, was adopted by the, the United Nations in Geneva in 20, um, 2007. So, Instead of attempting to describe the exhibition, I will just take you quickly through a short video just to give you an idea of the whole the exhibition, what we wanted to, to share in it. So I'm going to stop sharing this screen. I'm going to share another one. Sorry for that. to do what I want. So it's um in full screen it's better if it works. Otherwise we can just go like this. So the exhibition 
was based on two observations. One that indigenous people represent 6% of the world's population. And for many of them, um, climate change is more than ever a reality. And um, despite their cultural differences, they share common concern about the recognition of their collective rights. A second observation it shows that indigenous people own and control their land. The environment and biodiversity are better protected. Many of them share an ethic of care and repair. And this does not only apply to the care of objects, but also to the care of rivers, lakes, forests, and oceans. And the indigenous knowledge and skill that are um, mobilized include language and spirituality. And indigenous people practices are based on the maintenance of good relationship with the different elements making the ecosystem. And in that sense, human and non-humans have reciprocal responsibilities toward each other. In this perspective, a salmon, a river, a tree, or a mountain are animate partners. And indigenous people often speak about the important role they can play in finding alternatives to protect natural resources. But when this imbalance, this balance is no longer maintained, the crisis sets in, and the destruction of um, the exploitation of uh, resources um, are accelerating the climate crisis, which in turn accelerate land degradation. And many, many indigenous peoples claim to still be living in a colonial type relationship with the state in which they find themselves. And without prior consultation or consent, these states often prioritize economic development and activities such as mining or electronic projects on land that traditionally were occupied by uh, indigenous peoples. And the exhibition concludes with a time of encounter, inviting the public to see, hear, and listen to the testimony of indigenous experts and artists. It's in this space that the workshop with barriers took place. Um, we hope that through this uh, last space, we invited the public to uh, take a stand together with indigenous peoples with the aim to weave a common future based on the values of care, repair, and responsibility for all forms of life. So I should go back to the PowerPoint to show you some of the images of, of the actual workshop. Um, here we are, next one. So um, actually, before I really speak about the workshop, I just wanted to uh, say something about this um, uh, this showcase in which we um, shown one of Barry's um, artwork, this auto bag that was lent to us by um, Nonam. Uh, it was exhibited in this uh, third section of the exhibition that was dedicated to these reciprocal responsibilities between human and non-human. And the piece itself, I think, no, I'm, no, the piece holds the title of Spirit Vessel, but it was included in this showcase dedicated to, to the Mino Bima Bi Win, the good way of life, which is a concept that very well shows this notion of responsibilities to one another, human and non-humans. And so as uh, Barry just explained, uh, initially, we uh, borrowed the two uh, auto bags from the Nonam, and but as soon as we asked for uh, to borrow them, they told us that they were working toward um, doing a, a research project, but to contact indigenous people and to see if the objects were um, uh, sacred and what we they were supposed to to behave with them, and so. Um, after one week that we, when we, after one week of the of exhibition being open, we, the Nonam told us that they received a response from um, the community to ask them to take the ceremonial bag out of display. So we followed this uh, request and we took the the ceremonial bag out of display, um, and it was repaired. To, well, uh, it returned to Zurich. And so I guess uh, Hadrian can tell us more about uh, what happened after that. And so um, spirit, um, the spirit vessel of Barriers uh, stayed alone too. 
to extend this relationship between new creations and old museum objects and um, and this concept of um, the good way of life. And I want also to, to take you to another part of the exhibition where we presented the um, um, the new native, the, the declaration because it was a part of the introduction to the exhibition to tell the story um, behind and that connects the declaration to Geneva to really connect this story to the public in Geneva. So we told the story of the visit of uh, the Skahelevi general to Geneva in 1923 when he asked the League of Nations to um, and to be able to speak and to claim the rights of his people to to their rights. Uh, he was not received at the, the, the League of Nations, but he was received by the city of Geneva, and this created this first connection between Geneva and the how the National Confederacy. And uh, in another small part of this um, section, we presented this whole process that started in the 70s toward the, the signature of the declaration and uh, so it was really, as you said at the, at the in the introduction, it was a very long process to get from the start um, with the, in, the indigenous movement, and uh, and finally a a, a real um, declaration. And we sh we showed this declaration through some of some quotes within the exhibition. And so I will just finish my short presentation with. Uh, these few pictures of the workshop in Geneva, we you already saw the, the video, but I really like to see how we were all connected during this three hour workshop. So we, we uh, had two workshops um, in um, 27, 28 of April, 2022. And during the three hours workshop, um, it was at the same, it was, um, we were invited to, to, to listen to Barry's stories um to his to all his the work he has been doing and his connection with the the lives of indigenous people in Canada and to connect this to the art of making something that really um makes you you your mind focus on 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 what you're doing at the at the right moment and um the participants were really, um, I think they really uh, um, got a lot out of this whole collaboration with barriers, and the connection was strong and meaningful and uh, and very emotional. I think we were just, I think we had twenty one participants. We were too short of what was uh, hoped for, but we really encouraged also the museum staff to to take part in the workshop because it was another another an opportunity an opportunity to access the concern highlighted in the exhibition but in a different way than usual conferences and, and meetings and um, so i think i'm gonna stop here and it's a good moment to leave the floor to to hydro to tell us how everything happens in zurich where most of the work happened really so thank you very much for listening to me Thank you very much, Lucy. So, hi, Drun. Are you here? Yes, I'm here. Thank you so much. And uh, thank you so much for the invitation. Pleasure to be here. And uh, thank you, Barry and Lucy, for your great presentations. So, uh, I too will try to share my screen here. And uh, some of it would certainly be a, a bit of repetition. And uh, some of it you will have seen before. But let's see. Can you see my screen at all? No. No. Mm. 
Well, this doesn't look so promising. Just bear with me one more moment, please. Screen, the the sharing uh, button in the middle of the your your screen. Yes, I tried this, but it it requests other sharing options, which oh really, I haven't seen before, mm -hmm. and uh, it is as if I was supposed to okay something, which is a little bit weird. I, think... um, I, I try to put you as an animator, so maybe just uh, um, try again with um, the button, the green button, partager l'écran. Yeah, that's to what see. I'm doing. And then it shows me whiteboard and uh, system. This is you, weird. You can it, find... it doesn't have access to the desktop. Ah. Um, uh, do you have your power PowerPoint open uh, behind a Zoom screen? Yeah. Yes, I do. Hmm. But this doesn't seem to be working. What's the first box on that uh, uh, where it says whiteboard? What's the first uh, box you see in that list? It says it's it, it, the first box. You, know, you you can show it says mine says slides as virtual background and then portion of screen. It's That's desktop under, under and advanced. whiteboard. One, okay, you should have desktop as the very first one. It should say desktop one, and then it says whiteboard. Yeah. So yes. click desktop one. But that is not working. That's the problem. Okay. I see. This is weird. I was able to download your uh, document on Did my you? on my computer. Do you want me to share to try to share my screen? Yeah, please. Okay, I'll try it. Sorry about that. Thank you, Eric. Um... I'm not really a PowerPoint uh, expert. <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, Let's see. That is revision of So you should you should find a, a kind of presentation mode. Yeah. Tu peux aller dans Diaporama, Eric, je pense, et après lire à partir, euh, lire à partir du début. Oh, ça fait rien. Oh oui. Vous voyez mieux comme There ça? That looks oui. pretty good. Thank you so much. OK, OK. Thank you. Just let me know when you want. All right. To... All right. So... Um... Yes, uh, what you see here is the opening of the, the exhibition. Barry was talking about um, the, the treaties exhibition we had uh, last year, 2022. And um, with the title, What We Namar Promise, Indigenous Art and Colonial Treaties in Canada. And I would just like to um, get into how we how we came to realize an exhibition on treaties. Um, we were involved in a collaboration project with the university in Hull in Great Britain. And uh, they have a project, a research project called Treated Spaces. And as part of our um, involvement in that collaboration, we agreed to um, do a treaties exhibition. And uh, treaties is probably not the most, how could I put it, in, in Switzerland, not the most 
attractive topic, I guess, to have an exhibition on about. And uh, it was it was it seemed a bit of a challenge um, for once because the the topic is just huge. And uh, also because in Switzerland, the, the knowledge on indigenous treaties and uh, and the meaning of the treaties is is not really um, is not really there. And um, we knew that we didn't just want to have an exhibition that would draw from our collection or or other other indigenous collections, but we um, wanted to uh, have indigenous artists involved and and talk about their view of um, the treaty issues in Canada. And uh, Barry and and the Nonam, I guess it's it's fair to say we have quite the history together. Barry, what do you think? And um, yes. we've been working together quite a few times already. And uh, of course we were, uh, we, we knew about Barry's projects and um, we approached Barry to see if he was interested, would be interested um, in being part of that um, exhibition. And of course, because Barry had the Windsor project um, happening, um, he, he said, you know, this this is what I have, and and this this is what he saw really fitting for that for that project. And we were like, well, great, let's do it. And um, then the two other artists were involved. Um, Barry mentioned them earlier. Uh, one was Frank Schubergeget, and the other was Michael Belmore, and uh, they were on board too. And um, this is how we started out on a, uh, I could say, an exhibition adventure. And um, uh, Eric, could you could you uh, put on the the next uh, image? And um, as Barry was saying earlier too, this is Barry and Ambassador Patrick Whitman from the Canadian Embassy to Switzerland and, and Liechtenstein. And um, Barry was mentioning it, we opened the exhibition and, um, or, or maybe it was just before the opening of the exhibition and the Canadian Embassy um, gave us a call and said, we noticed you're doing this exhibition on, on treaties. So what is it about? And, and we'd be interesting, uh, interested to, to um, be involved in, in whatever way. And we thought, OK, that is really interesting. Because um, I think we never had anything like that happen before, and it showed the importance of the topic on an international level, I guess we could say. And uh, during the exhibition, it was, I think it was four times that the Canadian Embassy actually visited and participated and they supported the exhibition and the projects. And um, they, were, they were right there, they were right into the topic. And um, as I said earlier, uh, an exhibition on treaties, we quite frequently got the question, how on earth did you end up doing an exhibition on treaties? And what is it really about? And um, I think it was one of the, of the biggest exhibition adventures we ever embarked on because that project was so interesting. It was a great big learning experience for us. It was an amazing um, collaboration with Barry and, and Frank Schubergeget and Michael Belmore. And uh, I believe it was thanks to you, Barry, too, that the collaboration with the MEC came about as well. So it was like um, a triangle or a multi-angle whatever um, perspective which which came about thanks to those topics involved in in this exhibition and um, Barry is an amazing commu uh, communicator 
And uh, to have him on board in this project was, was an incredible experience. And what you see here, where he is explaining to the ambassador the, the uh, installation, as long as the sun shines, which is um, one of the, the, I guess, most frequently quoted sentences of uh, Canadian treaties um, to the ambassador is, um, is, I guess, exemplary to what Barry was doing during this exhibition and during the collaboration and his visit to Zurich and Switzerland. Um, Eric, maybe the next, the next image. So here too, he's explaining, um, he's introducing the audience to his piece. Barry, unfortunately, was not there um, for, the, uh, for the opening, but um, he arrived two weeks after that and, uh, and stayed for the workshops. And after Barry was left, um, Michael and Frank came. So we had about four weeks of, uh, of artists visiting and conducting workshops. And uh, the next image, please. So um, the exhibition took place in two gallery spaces. And this is the smaller space where we sort of had um, a historic introduction with a, with a timeline and chronology of, of treaty history. And uh, we tried to get people um, um, informed about different perspectives on treaty making. And um, it is because we have a certain perception of what a treaty is. And most people, when we ask, so what, what, what really is a treaty to you? It was pen and paper and a signature. And uh, in, in indigenous cultures and, uh, and within the context of treaty making in North America, it is so much more. It is an entire cosmos, it's a universe. And uh, it's a whole different story. And we try to get into that and open that up. And uh, the next image, please. So this is the second gallery where the, um, the artists presented their, um, their views of um, or, or connections to, to uh, the Canadian treaties. And uh, you, you see the map of Canada and uh, different quotes that were changing on this map. And in the background, you see the video um, Barry was uh, referring to earlier and behind that, his installation, As Long as the Sun Shines. And I'm not sure, um, Eric, is that the, the, the video image or is it just the image? I think it's just the image, right? I think it's just the image. Okay, then the next the next image, please. Yeah, it's just a, a few um, views of of the installation. Um, uh, compared to to the earlier image you saw of as long as the sun shines, which was um, the the straight one poom on a straight wall. Um, what our um, designer wanted to wanted to include in this installation was also a sort of United Nations um, feeling like, like as if you were in a sort of auditorium and as if you were listening to the calls of action and uh, also to, to um, emphasize the dialogue between the TRC calls to action and the um, Wawindama installation, um, which was referring to, to UNRIP. Next, please. Another image and uh, the straight view again is this uh, is this enlarged video um, of Barry um, at work actually, and uh, which um, gave a, uh, an idea of of his work with the um, with the electronic components and and the beading. Next, please. I think I'm at the end. That's at the end. Oh, that's the video. That's the video. Okay, maybe you can put that on. It's it's only a few seconds, but it gives you an idea of 
what is shown in the background. So there you see Barry's name coming up and, and his uh, tribal affiliation. And uh, it's like a zoom in of, of the actual video, which Dylan McLa uh, McLaughlin, a Diné uh, multimedia artist from the United States uh, made of uh, Barry in, when was that? Quite a few years back, I think. Yeah, that's it already. Next image, please. So here's the workshop. And Barry was uh, was talking about that already. And um, I think this workshop was one of the mo most amazing things we ever had at the museum. And um, it was um, not only because uh, we, we also had Helena there, but it was an amazing combination of Barry sharing his knowledge of beadwork with um, the, the participants of the workshop and also um, giving that space to talk about those issues of UNDRIP and, and the TRC. And um, it was a workshop, I believe we were there for more or less three hours or, or even more. And um, and people were working and beating and and making their medallions, and they were also communicating. And Barry was sharing his knowledge and and his input and his thoughts about um, about the contexts of those of those really important documents. And Helena was contributing, and there were quite a few people who had been um, involved in those uh, topics before and and also shared their knowledge and there would have, would would have been no way in a presentation or in a uh, in a lecture to sit there for 3 hours to listen to those contexts but within the workshop that all of a sudden was possible and when people left they like almost each of them approached us and said how what a, what a great experience it was for them and uh, and and they they all left very excited, and um, and and were just uh, amazed about what happened in that space. And for us, it was as a museum, it was a very very important experience to have that combination of sharing knowledge, of having a workshop, of doing something, of creating something, and then of sharing um, of sharing facts and thoughts and inputs. And of course, also what Barry said earlier, um, this um, um, giving away your or selling your rights to the piece for once with Frank. And uh, I think that too was a was, uh, very important experience for the participants that made them realize a little more about treaties and treaty making. The next, please. That is another short video, um, which just shows, yeah, if you can start it. The medallions, when they were finished within the vessel, the Wawindama, the promised vessel, and you see how differently they, they were done or finished or not finished. And then you have the script rolls and uh, which, which people were handwriting and on Barry's medallions, you had the context that was related to it. Thank you. Yeah, and those are just a few more um, images of the exhibition from the other artists. Um, that was a piece called Pop Fiction and in the background communities by Frank Schubergeget. Um, Frank, Sch so, so while Barry was addressing the issue of indigenous rights, um, Frank Schubergeget uh, Schuberge was talking about uh, reservations and communities and about um, um, housing on reserves and uh, the, the, the treaty money 
they received every year, which was more or less symbolic, like the $5 bill for their land. And uh, then next pictures, please. And Michael Belmore was talking about resources, resource extraction, and uh, he also finished with a piece um, with a with a sort of modern day wampum. You can just go through the, the the images right now. So it's just different views of the the exhibition space and the three artists that were involved and their perspectives on different issues regarding the the treaties and. Um, the audience, we did not expect like tons of, of people coming to this exhibition because uh, it was it was a challenging topic. But the people who came um, gave us their feedbacks and uh, they were that was a very interesting experience, too, because most people said, you know what, I did not have a clue. And they were totally astonished about the history, which was um, a Canadian history, because most people here expect histories like that from the United States, but not necessarily from Canada. And uh, so for us, it was um, it was a real learning experience. And uh, the, the most important part was really the um, the involvement of the artists and of, of Barry, of Michael and of Frank, um, and um, and their dialogues and getting getting in touch with the people, with our visitors, and with the museum team, who also profited from from hearing firsthand um, the issues that were involved in those topics. And then, of course, the connection to the Mac too, which was also an amazing and and important uh, experience. And uh, we have we have a great connection uh, thanks to Barry. As a as a networker par excellence, so thank you so much, and uh, sorry for the technical trouble, which was to be expected when I'm involved. Thank you so much, Una. Thank you. So I'm pretty sure there are many many questions. Uh... Mm -hmm. Natalie, I um, please feel free to ask your question if you want to. Or... As, as we said at the beginning, you can either uh, write your question in French in the conversation or either to raise uh, we, your hand. Yeah, we have a question here on the chat. Uh, from Daphne, thank you all for great presentation. A question regarding public reception. Could you feel a difference in public engagement between Canada and Switzerland? This is a question mine before Barry Ace. I mean, it is for you, Barry. Uh, so can you repeat the question again? Was a deeper, was it a stronger relationship between Canada and Switzerland? If you feel a difference between the enga engagement, public engage engagement. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So there was definitely, yeah, I understand now. There was definitely a uh, uh, a difference. Um, I think the the difference was in when I was in Windsor working on um, the uh, on the uh, the piece for as long as the sun shines, grass grows and the river flows, which was a TRC work. We had indigenous people involved in the project, uh, which we didn't have in Switzerland. So it was it was different uh, because I think it was very meaningful in both instances. But to have I was the only first voice, but I'm not a residential school survivor. I'm second generation, uh, third gen third generation. I'm third generation um, survivor. So um, the um, they're having somebody like having. Troy there, who was the first, you know, having experienced that, he could really share a lot with the um, with the participants, um, which it, it brought it it brought it uh, I think a stronger emotional response. It was very very uh, very moving, you know, and also uh, I think it was very cathartic for him as well. Um, so to witness that, and also that particular one was very different. It was. I had to be very, very mindful and very conscious of how it was affecting 
and Troy, you know, because now we have somebody who's opening themselves up and they're opening up all of those emotions. And I had to make sure that it was not only a safe environment, but he was protected in some way. Uh, so I had to manage the dialogue a little bit, like a little differently than I did in uh, in Zurich or in Geneva. But if there was similarities, it would have been through the law students, I think. Uh, the law students really brought a lot to the table. Uh, they brought knowledge. Um, and also, too, it was interesting, which I thought was interesting, was bringing linear thinkers together, which are legal. Uh, you know, finance, legal, people think very linear. Artists think very holistically. So the lawyers, the, the students that understood law could explain because remember we're taking we're taking something very very complex it's a complex legal document how do you turn that into a visual monomic language the art students got the concept easier than the law students did but i think the two speaking together really helped clarify it for one another so they completed the whole if you know what i mean it was um it was very, very diff like very difficult for the law students to understand the visual conceptual idea of the finished product, whereas the student, the art students, could see it. So there was it moved on a lot of levels. Um, it was um, it you know again it just brought everything together. And as as Runa had mentioned, it was um, it was a lot of it was a lot of management for me. I think, you know, I, I don't know how many needles I threaded because nobody could thread needles. They're very tiny. So I had to thread everybody's needles. So as soon as somebody was like, oh, can you help me thread? <laughs> but, uh, you know, like I said, and then and then participating and, and trying to give it some kind of uh, of a context. I think I think overall it was it was a different experience through both and, and both had their had their uh, had their positives, I think, you know, they, but different perspectives. Yeah. I hope that answers your question. Thank you so much. Yeah, I think that. But it shows you the power of art, you know, the power of art and um, in, in terms of, of reaching something. You know, if you give somebody a the, the undrip document to read, you know, if they're not interested, they're not going. But by uniting it with a making, you know, making something with your hands and you know, I think there's a connection between art and intellectual, like like something that's a very, very um, uh, literary complex, complex through a literary language, you know. So you're using both sides of your brain all at once because you're stitching and you're trying to keep content, but you're also trying to keep, you know, track of the conversation and what's being told. Um, so it's, it's, it's a very uh, holistic kind of an experience, I think. Um, and this, they were really excited too at the end to come and see the work. I know, like Lucy came all the way from Geneva, to, which I, you know, to 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 see the exhibition, and and some all the students that participated, and that was the same in in Windsor. They all wanted to see the finished product, and they were going around looking for their piece or looking, you know, and they could recognize their handwriting. But I told them, I said, you know, you're probably one of the last generations of people who are going to have cursive writing. Because they don't teach it in Canada anymore. They don't teach cursive writing. It's all electronic. And, and I think you, that's where you start to lose the human touch. You know, having that 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 handwritten document, it's very unique. You can recognize a person, but you can't recognize a person through a type text. So art, again, you know, um, and, and again, even just bringing that project to them, um, was this, uh, you know, uh, social justice through art, you know, basically, they went away with it, and they thought about it. And I know, they, I know, it sparked interest in in other areas of Indigenous politics and law for many of the students that were studying international law, especially in Geneva, they were really interested, and they wanted to know more. And uh, so, you know, it starts with a whisper. Mm -hmm. Maybe if I can add something, um, I think in, in Switzerland in general, the audience or participants are more shy to participate and to, to um, use their voice. And I think the workshop facilitated that a lot. It made it a lot easier for people to, to be part of it and to feel part of the group and to lose that shyness and to 
also ask their questions and and to share their knowledge. And I think in Canada, I would assume in Canada, people are a lot more used to being part of it and and uh, giving voice. And uh, here it is most mostly it's silence when you're asking questions. Thank you for your answers. That's really nice. Thank you. Is there any other question or comment or? Yeah, I'll try to. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, you can. Okay, so I can ask my, I mean, I don't have a, first of all, I want, I knew um, about the project through Barry. Uh, congratulations, it's the first time I'm hearing um, curators talk about this project and hearing their side of the, of the matter. I'm a, I'm a, a Frank, French and Canadian curator and I live in Canada, but I'm in France right now and I'm developing a project in France in a little city, uh, not that not that uh, little and not that big, called La Rochelle. And Barry came with other uh, artists and curators to La Rochelle. And we are uh, trying to involve uh, some of the museums over there to actually develop the kind of dialogue you, you've developed. So it's, it's very impressive. I'm very, uh, when I hear Hydrun saying, nobody knows about these treaties nobody and quite frankly this is what i what i feel also so um because we are embarking on the beginning a whisper maybe i should say and hoping that we're going to develop many things my question to you is so this project happened two two years ago or something like that i wanted to know maybe from uh, julie or hyrun if if they had an idea about following up uh, after this project to, because if this project raised awareness for all the students and the people who discover so many things, like do you, what kind of idea do you have to maybe continue this, this, this process to raise aware, awareness and maybe also to see how this awareness can contribute to to change. Is any of you wants to answer? Uh, um, I don't know, Hedrin, I'll let you start. Okay. okay. <laughs> thank you. Um, thank you for that, for, for your question, Catherine. Um, actually, I think uh, it, it happens with, with many exhibitions that, that uh, at some point I feel you, we should have a follow up. Because uh, the moment you're finishing an exhibition is actually the moment when you when you're in there, and then you're start you're stopping and you're opening the exhibition and the exhibition is running and your head is already busy with the next exhibition, which sometimes doesn't make so much sense. But uh, um, well, thinking of the workshops, which were really um, sort of an epiphany. Um, I thought that this this is really how it should work and what we should be doing in the future, and uh, it was it was quite clear that this would not have been the last time we have realized a workshop like that, and uh, and we have to keep that up. But thank you so much for reminding us because um, that's that's really the thing that uh, at, at some point you're involved in different projects and uh, and uh, you have the tendency to to forget about it but uh, that is really it and we can just nail <laughs> nail the next workshop with with Barry so when when you get time <laughs> and uh, and I think the undrip and the TRC especially um, 
are are so important. And I mean, we started last year, we started at the NONAM to um, pick up the uh, National Day for Truth and Reconciliation. And uh, last year we had uh, we had guests here, indigenous guests here, and this year we had it like rather small with an online talk. But for next year, there there are new plans, and uh, this this might be the setting to um, to to involve it, include it on a on a more regular basis. Or also in connection to the Indigenous Peoples Day, which is in Canada on the 21st of June. But uh, I think uh, the, those topics, they, they can't be like once and then never again topics. They, they need to be upheld and, and continued. And as Barry said earlier, 18 of the of the calls to action have been completed, and I think 24 are in in the process of. And then there is tons that that haven't even been started. Thank let's you. work together with La Rochelle. <laughs> and well, you know, <laughs> I think sharing your experience is actually. A very important step and yes this is definitely something to further discuss <laughs> thank you and um, maybe to to speak a bit about geneva um so this exhibition that we put up in 2021 um not only was the uh opportunity to speak about the uh, yun drip it was also an opportunity to work slightly differently uh in the whole process of making the exhibition as we worked in collaboration with several artists from different parts of the world uh the museum in geneva is uh, made up of collection of objects that come from all over the world we even include european collections so um in a way we even though we i think we should address treaties as well this hasn't been yet a subject that we had the chance to address really um because we have to talk about things happening all over the world and so in that sense next year we're going to have an exhibition about uh, colonial geneva okay and so to address this issue because for most swiss people i think switzerland never participated in colonialism which is something we have to uh, changing their mind and a lot of museums in, in Switzerland will be uh, addressing this uh, subject next year I think and um, and we are collaborating on that with um, uh, Sarah and the Dossip to talk again about uh, how the notionally um, the Vedic of Descahen in 1923 and this century um, as uh, we already did some ceremonies this year in Geneva about uh, to, to, to remind people about this, this visit and the UNGIP and the Hauta National Confederacy here. And, um, but then to go back to, uh, the workshop in themselves, I think they really inspired us. Uh, we had already been collaborating with the educational team on other small projects, but this one really, um, made us want to do more, uh, hands on work. That connect collections and and um, the actual practice, living uh, knowledge and know how. And um, so maybe I should. I think I didn't precise really at the beginning. I'm an object conservator, so I work really with the collection. I do uh, object uh, conservation work, and I really feel having been collaborating with several artists that and. We really experienced that with um, Barry looking at this bag that he showed at the end of his presentation. That when we look as conservators and, and artists who are interested in in um, uh, older pieces, we we share a common eye on the materiality. And artists have really a lot to teach us conservators about the knowledge embedded in objects and um, the significance as well. And and so um, so I think this is really something we want to continue. And we organized. Uh, two workshops this year in Geneva with artists, one with a European basket maker, and we made, we, we, did, we thought people were um, invited to make a basket following an older basket we have from our, our European collection. 
and we look at other baskets from the collection from other parts of the world. And we also had a workshop with a Nigerian artist from um, who is um, oh my my English was un, uh, leaving me, but um, who does um, bronzes sculptures, and we introduce the public to look into how. We didn't go until the end of making a bronze sculpture, but we we took to them through the process as well. So we hope to do more of these, but I think we owe a lot to Barry for the inspiration, obviously. Um, I just wanted to to add that you know it, this is the, you know we're talking about undrip and we're talking about um, how um, these uh, articles within um, undrip can make change, you know, basically policy, like the truth and reconciliation calls to action and uh, the UNDRIP, which is an international instrument, um, you know, is part of this. What we've done here with two institutions is we've helped start the decolonization process. You know, we basically um, brought in uh, the making of real change in these institutions. Um, and that is through these these uh, these legal these legal instruments. Um, so it's brought about positive change in these institutions. And Catherine, I'm just going to speak just very briefly about uh, what we're, the trip to La Rochelle was very very moving for me. And uh, we we visited these institutions, some of which were certainly not as open as uh, Nonam or the Meg are. Uh, you know, La Rochelle is a very interesting town because uh, the colonization of Canada pretty much started uh, through the port of La Rochelle. Um, also, they have a very, very uh, long and disturbing history with Nantes as well uh, for the slave trade. So there's a lot of work to be done in these institutions uh, in terms of um, addressing this. But they're aware of this. They're, it's not that they're oblivious to it or... or, or, or not wanting to do something. They're just kind of at that cusp, I think. Um, so I was thinking about, well, what could I do now? You know, how can I take what I did with these two institutions, like the Meg and 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 Nonam, and bring that to um to La Rochelle? So now I want to do another collaborative work because that's the way you reach people through this, you know, art um, through art and the creation process. So I'm going to be working with two French artists. And we're going to be work using the wampum again the, the, as the tableau. And we're going to create a work around re, uh, repatriation from two perspectives. And it's going to be a woven piece. So, uh, and there will be public participation in that as well. So again, this opens up that dialogue between uh, what institutions are struggling with, uh, many institutions of, of repatriation. You know, one, I remember uh, we were talking at one, I won't name an institution, but we were talking in La Rochelle and the biggest concern was we're losing something and we're saying, well, no, you can take a contemporary work like no, like Runa did, you know, with uh, the spirit vessel and yes, and you can repatriate the ceremonial piece. But the question kept coming up, but what do we really have? I said, well, you have a piece that is indigenous. You have a piece where you know the maker, you know the meaning, you know where the provenance, you know all of that, and you're giving up something that you that may have a very, very disturbing history, and you're sending it back to the, to the community. So a hundred years from now, this contemporary piece will be just as important as a historical piece because it is it is part of the indigenous continuum. It's just at a different point on the continuum. That was such a hard concept to get across, wasn't it, Catherine, in terms of uh, the institution sort of understanding that? I know Adrian talked about, Adrian Stimson talked about it, I talked about it. Um, so those are kind of, kind of the, the barriers that we have to kind of address. And I, so I'm thinking, I'm hoping with this new uh, collaborative exchange between um, uh, French artists and Indigenous artists and creating a collaborative piece and bringing the institution people into that setting to create, just like we did in, in Nonam and in at the Meg. So we can sort of revisit and talk about that. And I think by the making, it will, and their involvement in it will make them feel uh, the preciousness and I guess, I guess the ceremony and the meaning behind the work. And it'll bring something, uh, you know, very, very tangible to them. Anyway, yeah. so I just want I just wanted to share that.
I think Joanna Maybe. Massa. Uh, oh, sorry. The question. Sorry. <laughs> no, no, but no you, question. You can... Yes, I think they, there is one well, uh, from Joanna Massa. Ah, sorry. I saw a little hand a few minutes ago, but. You can go, Runa, and uh, maybe Joanna will uh, speak later, or maybe the question is uh, not uh, uh, to ask anymore. Thank you. I just I just wanted to to um, add to what what Barry said. Um, for us, this is uh, this this is a wonderful process actually to to really. Um, focus on indigenous art because in my opinion if we include indigenous art in in the collections and and in the exhibitions that's all we need because indigenous art has all the messages that we need to hear and and this is uh this is um i i guess it's it's an important um what do you call that uh sort of megaphone um, today to bring across indigenous um, perspectives and uh, what what we as as museum people I guess and and everybody else too needs to learn first of all is to listen and and like truly listen and the next step would be to to understand try to understand different perspectives. And I guess what is happening, um, what you were talking about earlier in La, in La Rochelle, is um, is a is a learning process, and uh, we're looking from completely different Western perspectives um, at the collections, and uh, don't necessarily want to let go because um, because of the feeling that that you're losing treasures. But um, if you get into the topic, there is so much more, so many more important issues involved in those collections and in the processes of returning them and entering those dialogues. I think that's one of the most important things we, we need to understand and need to, to, to do today. And uh, like, I am applauding La Rochelle for inviting the indigenous delegation to come there and to, um, as I understood it, to give their input about museum work and and maybe about uh, uh, creating new exhibitions, and this is the 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 next um, important step that we need that collaboration and that we need your input, like Barry and 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 everybody uh, who is indigenous and and who might be listening. We need the inputs and and we need the knowledge and we need to know how you want to be represented in our spaces here. And uh, we, it's the time that that we are doing this by ourselves. I think that is history, or it should be, anyways. And uh, and and those are, yeah. I think it's it's the greatest thing to do. If you ask me. Thank you. Um, just to conclude, there is a message in the chat room. Uh, I think it's for you, Barry, and it's quite touching. I'm just going to read it, uh, read it, sorry. Thank you. It's from Sukhan Tipi. Uh, thank you so much. Miigwech, merci, danke schön. I learned a lot as I listened to what you all shared. Barry, I was honored to meet you before the pandemic when you came to Gatineau University, UQ, to offer a presentation in an open class in our arts program. And I'm following your work since then. Uh, miigwech to all of you as I have to leave for another meeting. And so Doris, I think we can we can conclude the session. I wanted to thank you so much. Thank you for that so inspiring discussion who bring us so many hope i mean you you all of you you showed us so we we can build together some project that create new collective collective between art and law and let us hope i think for a better world so thanks for that and hope to see you soon 
Thank, thank you. you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Barry and Runa and this. Thank you so much. Well, thank you to you. Thank you, thank guys. You much. It was great to, to see you all. It was wonderful. <laughs> yeah. Next time in person. <laughs> yeah.